spend a few minutes trying to put this meeting in a perspective of the work we've been doing up until now and where we want to go. And the last session with the presentations by Rudolfo and Frank was particularly appropriate, though I, which I can't say I had the wisdom to plan it that way. It, it happened that way by its own inspiration. But uh, it, it summed up a lot of the reason why we're here. And I, it made me reflect on the history of why we're here. Up until 2010, the Academy, like many other organizations, uh, was focusing on individual problems. We had programs on nuclear disarmament, we had conferences, we even went and testified before NATO uh, about uh, that. They even financed a workshop we had in Zagreb. We had uh, uh, programs on environmental issues, on development issues, uh, information science. It went back 30 years, the Academy was one of the or early uh, groups looking at the impact of information as it was evolving and all. But in the last eight, nine years, eight years uh, since Alberto and I have been uh, very closely in involved with the programming, uh, we've really been trying to look at how this all comes together. And the the first real opportunity and challenge was when the United Nations invited us to conduct a, two, a, a major conference with 200 diplomats and heads of international organizations, NGOs, on what we called the new paradigm. And the only thing we really knew meant by new paradigm at that sense was that the existing paradigm was simply not working and not sufficient to address our problems. And we knew it's not a new paradigm just in economics, or a new paradigm in governance, or a new paradigm in ecology, or a new paradigm in education. It's really something more. And so at that meeting in Geneva in June of 2013, we gathered together experts from all of the sectors uh, on the need for a new paradigm. And we ended up doing what has been done many times before, is identifying the problems. And even when we said we want to talk about the solutions, it's a lot easier to talk about problems and the solutions. And so when we look back on the meeting after the fact, well, we really told ourselves what we already knew coming in, except we heard it from a lot of other people, and we know that we all agree. And we came out of that with a, 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 with a basic conclusion, which these two gentlemen really presented in their own words today, and that is, it's not enough that we understand the problems. It's not enough that we change the policies. It's not enough we change the institutions because the roots are deeper. The roots go very well back into the very thinking on which our institutions and policies and actions and strategies are based. And so we constituted the international working group on uh, uh, new economic theory. Uh, not that we were more, not that economic theory was the root of all our problems. We could have had the, the new working group on new political theory as well, because by the, or new legal theory for that matter, or new education for that matter, because essentially we needed to deal with all of them. And the working group happened to have a name, but we really ended up covering a very wide range of discussions on what, how our, our theory had to change which meant how our academic traditions had to change, and how our education had to change, and as came out beautifully in the previous session, how our thinking had to change. And we created the World University Consortium after that to handle the educational part of it, because that's a big chunk by itself. And we had the, the economic working group to focus on 
uh, the economic side of it, and as uh, uh, Eric has mentioned, I think we have more than right now, actually, on the idea of new paradigm, we have more than 200 articles in Cadmus uh, over the last eight, nine years, and half of them are on economics, probably, and half cover governance issues, global and domestic, and democracy, and education, and other parts of it. And a few of them, but I think very important, address this fundamental issue of how our thinking has to change. Uh, and that's been beautifully summarized. And we've been doing it. We've had about 15 meetings here, and uh, many more in other formats elsewhere. Uh, but now the question is where we go from here. Uh, a year ago, we started discussions with the UN in Geneva. Some of you know the whole story. Some of you know a little of it. Some of you, this may be new. Uh, on uh, a new conference at the UN, because they said, and this is their words, not ours, uh, they said that the conference in 2013 I'd like to say it was one of the most successful conferences, but that's not what they said. It was the most successful conference they had, which sounded a bit outrageous, to be frankly. But that was what uh, a senior, very senior person in the UN said, and said, we'd like to do something again. Well, we know going back to talk about the problems <laughs> is not going to take us where we need to do, go. So we were looking for a proposal as to how we could meaningfully relate to the UN at this time. And we formulated two proposals, briefly. One was, well, look, UN has agreed on implementing the SDGs. Uh, and we know clearly that it's not enough. We understand the problems. We're going to need not only new policies. We're going to have to change our institutions. We're going to have to change our education. We're going to have to change the way we think about it. So what about this? And the director general said in Geneva, this is what we need. This is what we want. Please detail out the proposal and come back, and we can finalize. And we took about six months to do that. And during that time, I met with Ban Ki-moon after his retirement from the UN and had a discussion with him on exactly the same thing, congratulating him for what he had done but saying, I think we all know now that formulation of the goals, however great and significant it is, is only the first step. And we need much more, much more at deeper levels if we're hoping to do this. And we went back to the UN. And at that time, in that six month period, the director general said, you know, your proposal's really good, but since I said yes to it, so much is happening that I wonder whether we really need this anymore. And just at that time, his chief of cabinet, who's a fellow of the academy, actually they're both fellows of the academy, uh, uh, said, you know, actually, I like the second proposal better. He said, what was the second proposal? I don't even remember it. It was on global leadership in the 21st century. And he said, well, ask them to give, the, uh, give us a proposal for that. And that took another six months <laughs> to develop. And it was really the one we wanted to do. We had given the first one simply because we thought we'd be talking to their needs or what they were interested in rather than what we were interested in. And it came full circle. And finally, in May, the director general signed the proposal and sent announcement to all the UN agencies and all the member states announcing the beginning of that and promptly within a week he was informed that he's retiring. Uh, which didn't come as a surprise, but we were hoping it was a year later, <laughs> not uh, a year earlier. And then we had to wait three months more for the new Director General, Tatiana Valovaya, from Russia to be appointed, and in suspense as to whether she would like to support something which has now become an official program of the UN in partnership with the UN, or whether she would just put it on the back burner. And it's only a month ago, five weeks ago, that she confirmed that she's fully committed to this and wants to go ahead with it. And has already, as 
has been mentioned already agreed on the dates for a, 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 a summit, a two-day summit for about six or eight hundred people uh, next October and during the, the 75th anniversary of the UN. So we came up with a strategy. Uh, this is an ambitious uh, project by any, for any organization or any organizations. And our strategy was we want to have this discussion with a much broader group of stakeholders. Uh, we want to include, and I'm coming, what we think, what we remembered last, the uh, mentioned, so I put it first. We said we have to include the, the community of artists, uh, those who lie outside of traditional academia, uh, because they have a very important role to play, not only in understanding, but certainly in communicating uh, this. We included the business and finance community, and we are in the early stages of discussing with uh, organizations that could represent that on a global basis. Uh, we included science and technology, and Rudolfo started our discussions with IEEE as an example of a global organization representing a vast network in science and technology. Uh, and we've begun our discussions with organizations representing the universities about the need for change in education. And we're just at the beginning, and Tom is uh, taking a key initiative on this of approaching youth organizations, uh, because we believe, I believe, that as, they're as important or maybe more important than any of the others, because we're talking about the future. And it's only their perceptions, their aspirations, and their determination are going to end up with where we go with this. And member states come in there somewhere, and UN organizations come in there somewhere, and civil society organizations come in there. And we started with a briefing of the last three on November 8th. And I wanted to go back. I'm telling this story, one, to say this is a process. You know, it's not like we're coming to, we have been going through a process the last 10 years, you can say <coughs> earlier too, but I'm more conscious of it. I've been with the academy for 25 years, but the last 10 years I'm much more clear about the direction and intention and the process that we've been going through. And Alberto and I have been through dozens of the different steps in that process. And we realized the meeting next year is only a step in the process, as this is. But I must say that this meeting particularly uh, really exceeded my expectations, because I know we were doing something very difficult. We're talking about a subject that, at one sense, is so complex, is so specialized, has been left so much to the experts that even most economists feel they shouldn't be talking about it. But we've managed to talk about it in exactly the perspective that we've been talk that we've been trying to approach the global challenges today, to recognize it at the level of society, at the level of human beings, at the level of uh, our thinking processes, our value systems, our perspectives, our narrative, all of the words that you have been uh, using today. So for me, uh, this was a very fulfilling experience simply because I learned a lot from it, and it, it helped take, I think it helped me, and I hope it helped others of us in and outside the academy uh, to, to get, to put this, this in a wider perspective that it needs to have. Uh, so we're proceeding now, but the question came up even on the first day, uh, we need changes of such great magnitude. And that's how we started the first morning. We started by talking about the global challenges. Challenges and opportunities. And Tibor did that, and I particularly wanted him to lead off because he's one, however optimistic he may be, he has a way of presenting us with everything uh, that we'd like to forget. Uh, he's very realistic. He's been a diplomat. He's been dealing with uh, 
the diplomats at the global level on the problems of nuclear disarmament and arms control, and uh, he knows how to uh, put things uh, and make us cope with reality. Uh, but we also, the issue came up, is a change of this magnitude that we need even possible? And the part of the project that we're doing with the UN is to convince ourselves and other stakeholders that it's not only possible, but it's inevitable. And it's not the first time. This is not a singularity uh, like the big boom, the big bang, or the uh, origin of life on Earth. This is a process humanity's been going through for many years. All of us have lived through a very impossible paradigm change at the end of the Cold War. Uh, and having been involved with an international organization that was working and hoping for something like this, I know, I don't know anybody uh, who predicted in 1987, or even conceived in 1987, or 1988, or 1989, that within one year, the Berlin Wall would collapse, the Germany would be reunified. Uh, the Soviet, the communism would be swept out of Eastern Europe. The Soviet Empire would be dissolved. And the arms race, at least temporarily, would so drastically be reduced. Uh, in just a couple of years, world military spending fell by, 30, by one third. Uh, I didn't need anybody who predicted any of it. Uh, and we've lived through it and seen. It doesn't mean that when we got through that, suddenly all our problems were solved. But if you think back to the magnitude of the change, I don't think the magnitude of the change we're thinking about today is uh, orders of magnitude greater. It just has to be all of us and not just a, a part of us. And that's the challenge of globalization in the last 30 years. And so when we started meeting with the UN agencies and member states in our briefings, we asked them to reflect back on what are the paradigm changes we already know about? What are the social transformations that we've already been through? Uh, and we went back to the, end of the abolition of slavery and the American Civil Rights Movement and the Green Revolution in India, which converted uh, <coughs> deficit food nation, second largest in the population in the world, to a surplus exporting nation within 10 years. And we, we asked them to reflect from their own experience what they have seen. Uh, and I think it's pretty clear that when we look at the process, we see that this is something we already know. What we maybe don't know is consciously how we did it and consciously how we can accelerate it, and what knowledge we can learn from all the transitions in the past, whether it's the abolition of colonialism. I, I mentioned it on the first day, I think. Uh, if you read the history of the founding of the UN, nobody predicted in the founding of the UN and the development of the Security Council that the colonial empires which occupied at least a third of humanity were going to disappear within 15 years. The colonial powers especially didn't predict that. And if that's not paradigm change, I don't know what is. So the process we're reflecting on, and I'm, I'm doing this to try to put this meeting into perspective, is what can we learn about what's already happened so that we can apply this long, slow process of social evolution and consciously apply it for rapid, radical social transformation? And that's what we've asked the UN agencies to do. We've seen uh, the abolition of polio and to TB and AIDS, there's been a big progress on it. There are all types of sectoral changes that have been rapid. But now we've got the whole thing. And we know, and that's something you have been mentioning over and over again, is we can't do it on a piecemeal basis. 
we can't just go after the economics of inequality or financial markets and later we'll take care of the environment or uh, democracy. We have to do it all as one. And that, I think we can say, I don't think we've ever done that before. But that doesn't mean we don't have valuable experience to bear on this. The academy is not an institution for policy making and implementation. That doesn't mean that this that that's a very, that we have lots of institutions for that and they're very valuable. I don't think we have we see that as our role. That's not historically been our role. We're trying to ask the questions that need to be asked and look at the kind of thinking we need to address them. And as Eric said, uh, we're not very well known, certainly related to the issues that uh, in order to get into the world. And now we have an opportunity, a unique opportunity in the next 12 months at the UN in New York on a critically important issue of money and finance, which we've been discussing. But that's a smaller part of a much bigger picture uh, at the UN in uh, Geneva uh, in next October. And that's not the end of any process. We're clear. At best, that's another step in the process. We've already had five international meetings on economic theory. I think you've been at least to three of them, if yeah, I'm not, not mistaken. Uh, we've had four now on the need for a new paradigm in education. And this is an ongoing process, but I think at this level of discussion, we're on the right track. And now we have an opportunity, and how we do it, and how well we do it, remains to be seen. That's the challenge. I'm putting it forth to you so we can all understand it and share it. Is how effectively can we bring the quality of thinking, or the integrality of thinking, that has come up, or a value-based thinking, a human inspired thinking that we're not, as uh, Lynette uh, said, we're not cast away by the magic of technology uh, or the magic of public policies or financial markets or mm -hmm. anything else, that we see this. All of these have a center. And at the center, we put the human being. And we said it's a change <coughs> in our values, our perceptions, our understanding, our actions that's necessary in all of these. And we can't rely on anything else to do it if we're not going to do it. So I wanted to thank you all for a really active, creative participation with your patience with an agenda that doesn't have a clear, linear line to it, hard to, uh, but which covered a wide range of issues that I think it was right that we talk about. And I'd also like to invite you all to stay, with, stay in the dialogue and the process and, uh, and help us, uh, or rather work with us, to uh, move this ahead. We have an opportunity. We need connections all over the world. We need to involve groups and organizations and the right people all over the world, even if you know one more person who really has something valuable to contribute. That's a, a valuable contribution. Thank you.